Good afternoon. My name is Robin, and I will be your conference operator. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to preparing your fleet for a hard insurance market presented by Hub International. All lines have been placed on a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct an interactive question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during that time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. You will hear a tone acknowledging your request and a prompt to record your name. If you would like to withdraw your question, please press star, then two. I will now turn the conference over to our host, Ms. Kathleen O'Shaughnessy, Marketing Manager. You may begin your conference. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining this call. Today's webinar on preparing your fleet for a hard insurance market is part of our Hub International's ongoing efforts to educate clients and those in the industry on changes in the transportation insurance marketplace, as well as best practices in transportation safety. This presentation is being recorded for your convenience, and the slides and recording for this webinar, as well as all of our previous transportation and risk management webinars, will be available on our website. Before we proceed a bit about Hub International, Hub International Limited is a leading North American insurance brokerage that provides a broad array of property and casualty, life and health, employee benefits, reinsurance, investment, and risk management products and services throughout offices located in North America, as well as Brazil. We're ranked um, tenth among the world's largest insurance brokers and have a variety of experts in a number of specific industries. We have over 250 offices and over 5,000 employees across North America. In 2000, um, sorry, I misspoke. Hub also has a very strong and uh, dynamic transportation industry specialty. Within our risk services division, we have board certified and degreed safety, security, property, environmental, emergency, business continuity, and claims management professionals with an average of over 20 years experience. We have a number of industry specific specialties made up of experts with decades of experience working in those industries before going into risk management. This variety of disciplines enables Hub to respond to our clients' specific risk control needs and objectives. Today's presenters are Jerry Gilligan and Steve Fojan. Jerry Gilligan is an Executive Vice President for Hub International Transportation, a division of Hub International. Jerry has been associated with the transportation industry for more than 25 years. He's worked for a large trucking company, as well as for insurance carriers and brokers. He has a high level of expertise in all areas of the business. A Mississippi State University graduate, he took transportation courses while earning his bachelor's degree in business. His first career was being part of a management program with Roadway Express, which at the time was the largest motor carrier company in the United States. From there, he went to work in the insurance industry, focusing on transportation-related risks. He originally was the regional sales manager for transport insurance. He then moved into a sales leadership role with the truck insurance at Progressive Insurance. Afterward, he owned and managed his own agency that specialized in transportation risks for the Texas market that was eventually acquired by Hub International Transportation Insurance Services. He is now a senior member of that team. Steve Bojan, our other presenter, is a senior national consultant supporting clients across the country with significant fleet exposures as well as clients of Hub Transportation's insurance services. Steve has more than 17 years of operations and risk management experience in the transportation industry. Previously, he worked for a large international insurance carrier as part of their loss control group that focused on transportation-related risks. Prior to that, he was a claims and risks manager for a large truckload fleet based in the Midwest and worked in operations for a number of logistics op organizations. He has worked with many clients to identify fleet exposures and come up with innovative solutions to improve safety performance. Steve has a master's degree from Miami University and a bachelor's degree from the University of Illinois. And now we'll get to what you came here for, our presentation. 
Thank you. This is Jerry. I just want to tell you guys, I've sat through a lot of these uh, webinars, especially in the last month since January 1st, and uh, I find myself sometimes looking away and doing my other work that needs to be done. And what we're going to try to do today is make this thing very informative, but keep it short. But we want you to ask us questions either now or email us or a call later. But you can always reach out to any of the hub specialists that are in your area, and they can help you with any of these things that we talk about today. Our agenda, if I can go through it, is uh, we're going to talk about the present state of the fleet insurance market today. And as you can tell by the title, it's getting hard. And what's caused this sudden change? The characteristics and data that underwriters are looking for, the critical value that an experienced insurance broker brings to the table, implementing meaningful change to your fleet safety program and improving your fleet data. And we'll talk more about the details of those. And at the end, we'll have a question period, maybe even answers to go along with those questions. Uh, the first slide there is the present state of uh, fleet insurance market. Uh, it's going up. I mean, that's why we're having this webinar. We've been hearing about it for a couple of years, um, but nothing's really been happening other than talk. And maybe everybody got tired of hearing the rumors about it, kind of like CSA. Is it really coming? Uh, you know, we have seen in the last four or five months, we've seen rates go from 5% to 50%. Uh, and I've talked to some of my cohorts who've heard seen bigger numbers than that. Uh, and I think one reason is because insurance companies have been losing money for the last few years. Uh, they've always been able to make it back on investment income, but that's not the case today. And some of the competition is gone. Uh, that competition was driving down the price just like it does in the trucking industry. Uh, some big names that have been riding trucking are no longer doing it, including CNA, Companion, Delos, State National, National Specialty, Gramercy. Uh, I, I ran out of room on my paper, but the list keeps growing. Uh, we're hearing that, uh, you know, they're, they're declining to quote on a lot of people. And we'll talk more about CSA score, but that's one of the big things. Obviously, losses, financials, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, they just don't want to take that chance on people anymore. And we wanted to bring this uh, webinar to you today because we think it's time to take action. We've seen people in, in October, and November, and December who waited, and the results weren't good. Uh, if you aren't planning early, doing something about it, the results are going to be negative. There's plenty of information today online about the carriers, as you were talking, Jerry. This includes data on commercial motor fleets. Anyone, including your insurance carriers and customers, can go to the FMCSA website and look up a commercial motor vehicle operator that has a DOT number. Um, you can get a lot of detailed information from there, including roadside inspections, DOT reportable crashes, and whatnot. Additionally, there are many driver blogs out there where the, the carrier, the uh, insurance carriers are able to see what your drivers are saying, the grievances that they're putting out there, and other dirty laundry, and it's there for everybody to see. Today, many crashes that happen are reported with a large amount of detail, and the media is putting this information online, much more so than three or four years ago. For example, in the newspaper on Monday, uh, there was an article about the weekend crash involving a motor coach in California where seven people were killed and more than 17 were injured. The article went into great detail in the first few paragraphs about that actual bus's roadside inspection history over the last couple of years. It included, they cited four inspections that included brake deficiencies. After the crash, the bus driver commented that there was a problem with the brakes that at least contributed to the crash. This type of situation is a plaintiff attorney's dream and can lead to huge claim costs, including the potential for punitive damages, which, depending on which state you're domiciled in, aren't always insured. The changes in the marketplace we touched on a little bit, but let me go into a little more detail on them. Insurance companies historically have priced as close as they can to break even, but making money back on investment income. You know, the stock market has been good or bad, but insurance companies have to invest very conservatively. Uh, that means T-bills, bonds, money markets, and those returns, as Steve pointed out to me the other day, are almost zero. So that means they won't make any money back on what they're losing on the other side. And there's no more, there's no more room for that. Um, I think the loss ratios now are probably exceeding 100% for most carriers. The big carriers may not mention that number to you. But when you look at financials that are posted, they are, they're showing 100% loss ratios. And, you know, what it includes in that is all the expenses and all of the uh, losses that go into it. 
So they were hoping to make 60 or 70% loss ratio where they have a chance for profit year after year. And when you get to 100% with no investment income, it's kind of the end of the story. The end of the story, as I mentioned, all those carriers are out of business. Uh, and the big companies, I don't want to go into a lot of names, but the guys that you've seen forever, Liberty Mutual, AIG, Great West Century, they're not going to go out of business. They're going to make their prices high enough where they can sustain and probably try to make back some of the money they've lost in the last few years. I'm not going to say gouging, but let's just say they've lost money and they need to make it back. Uh, a huge issue, as Steve was pointing out to me, is what we used to talk about, shock losses. You know, you've never seen something like this, crazy occurrence. Now it's becoming normal, so we don't even call them shock anymore. And then the economy has been in pretty tough position for the last couple of years, and so claimants are looking for deeper pockets. What's the easy way out? And guess who's helping them? Plenty of attorneys. You can't ride down the road without seeing their signs, and it starts off with, were you hit by a truck? Could you have been hit by a truck? Uh, and, you know, it gets people's attention. Uh, these, uh, these attorneys understand fleet best practices, and they can pick out problems during the pretrial phase. Additionally, some clients have done a mediocre job in screening drivers or have little or no safety program in place. The company driver is always expected to be the professional, and when they have a poor driving record or little or no training, the plan of attorney will pounce on that issue. And that means our insurance company has to settle to keep it out of, out of the jury's sight. It's always a loser. So let's talk a little bit about what underwriters are looking for when they see a submission. Um, you know, they're, look, they're looking for all the things they've always looked for. They're just looking for them a lot closer now because now there's so many people looking over their shoulders, including their bosses, um, stockholders, and their board of directors, their reinsurers who are pr giving them a lot of pressure on pricing as well. But the number one thing that's changed is CSA. Uh, the Federal, Go Federal Motor Go uh Federal motor carrier came up with CSA to make it easier to see more motor carriers and see them in a little more depth. So they had a feel of what was going on. The only reason was to help reduce accidents and fatalities. That's the reason for it. Now, underwriters are using this as a free way to understand who's a better carrier, who's a worse carrier, because it's all a ranking. I'll go into that in a little more detail in a moment. Uh, but even the biggest insurance companies out there will flat out tell you, I look straight at CSA numbers before I look at the submission. So that just tells you where we stand and what we're going to talk about today is what to do about it. Um, they're also looking for loss, loss runs, obviously. That's always been important, and it is today. Uh, and if you think you're going to get it with one of the better carriers who are going to offer one of the better prices, your loss are going to be better than the competition. Uh, if you've got a couple of claims that are six-figure, you're going to be on the bottom of that stack. And that's what we have to work towards, and it's not an overnight fix, as I'll say several times here. It's things we need to work on to improve. They're also looking at strong financials. I mean, truck companies have had a tough time in the last few years, the economy alone. And they understand if you're not making, you know, $100,000 every week. But they're also looking if you've had two or three years of bad losses, what are you doing about it, and what position are you in? And the reason they ask, in case you're wondering why this is so important, is because if you don't have – a solid financial, then you probably can't spend as much money on the maintenance as you should. You might be bringing in the drivers who will take 30 cents a mile versus 35 or 40, because it's all you can afford. You might be not worried about safety and having a program because it costs more money. And you might ask the guy to go ahead and push this one load because we really need it. Uh, the last thing I was going to mention was I think a stable history is important. If you've moved carriers every time, every year, uh, a new insurance company will say, why don't I want to take a chance on a guy who's going to be with me for one year? Because in this business, they think if an insurance might for three or four years, we have a good odds of making money with them. If it, if it comes one year, has a loss and leaves, we have no chance. So that's, uh, it, it kind of makes people not as interested in you. And, and I, I will say that a lot of times it's the agent that does that, moving people to the cheapest market, but they look at it, believe me. A number of years ago, I was sitting with the vice president of risk management for my employer, which was one of the largest transportation companies in the United States at that point. He told me, basically, risk management is 90% hiring, 5% management, and 5% luck. And he said, let me correct it. Risk management is 90% management, 2.5%, 90% excuse me, 90% hiring, 2.5% management, and 7.5% luck. Started wondering why I was employed, but in general, most fleets hire their problems. 
Vehicle fleets are incredibly hard to predict and control because individuals that drive as a significant part of their job have little direct supervision while they're behind the wheel. They tend to take additional risks because of this lack of oversight and because so many people view driving as an unalienable right. They learn when they're 16 years old and we do it all the time outside of work. They bring those bad habits from the evenings, from family events, from whatever, into their work activity. Because of all these challenges, hiring qualified, safe, and responsible drivers is critical. Most companies cannot retain, retrain personal values and improve the physical condition of employees. They will perform as they're hired. Looking at past safety, safety performance and having strong hiring criteria that are followed is critical. There also needs to be a well-structured safety program in place. This needs to include an onboarding process that explains driver performance expectations, how to do key driving skills, and what to do when things go wrong, such as when a crash occurs. Drivers should also be required to attend regular safety, regularly scheduled safety meetings that include discussions about defensive driving, seasonal driving issues, and any recent crashes. The program should have a written safety document that Taught that speaks to the ramifications of moving violations, negative observations, and crashes. These could include discipline, remedial training, and possibly additional observations. The use of electronic fleet monitoring systems or telematics is also preferred by many underwriters. It is considered, considered to be a best practice that is being used by many, if not most, of the well-run fleet operations in the United States. These telematics allow the company to better track driver safety metrics as well as vehicle location. Insurance carriers also like to see a well-documented crash management program in place. When a crash occurs, it can be very, a very stressful experience, and having a written guide ensures that critical areas are not overlooked. Lastly, low driver turnover indicates that jobs are desirable and that a good class of employees is behind the wheel. One of the most common times for drivers to have a crash is during their first six months of employment. By alleviating turnover, this risk is mitigated. I would just add to that that I think what I see at so many trucking companies I go to is if the owner and president and management team is on board with safety, is a parent. And when they put a sign up that says safety first, as big as a wall, it really means nothing that they are behind it. And the drivers see it, dispatch sees it, because the president comes in right with that sign over his head that says safety first, says go ahead, let that guy go tonight, and tomorrow let him make the tree rest. That's not safety first. Uh, and and it's, it's apparent. And where it's becoming apparent now is when we turn, turn a submission in on new account, and they say, well, look at the CFA scores, look at the losses, my guess is it's not as safe as you're telling us it is. So they can see right through it. I mean, if a loss control guy goes out there, he's going to see it as well. It's more apparent than you might think. So we've come to uh, what does a high-value broker bring to you? What I want to say right here is this isn't a sales pitch for Hub. It's more of a recommendation that you make sure you have the right advisor or consultant or an agent that specializes in, in transportation to be on your team. This is going to be tough, what we're going to go through this year and next year. I want to make sure I have the right person helping me. Um, you need somebody to have an, be willing to have an honest discussion about what's going on in the marketplace and what insurance companies think about or are going to, are going to think about your risk. You do not need someone to uh, tell you what you want to hear. The change need to be made to be a better company overall and a more attractive risk for insurers is much easier to do on a proactive basis where improvements can be made in a systematic way to benefit the entire organization. He or she must know the insurance market thoroughly and the strengths and weaknesses of each company. In a soft market, when all we worry about is price, no one looks at these things or they don't look at them enough. They're very important today. Someone may say, hey, I do, I write insurance with a lot of trucking uh, insurers. Believe me, it's not the same as here's the clients I have with this one and this one and this one. Be able to pick up the phone and call that underwriter or senior manager on his cell phone. That's a relationship you need in a hard time. Our pricing is Crucial, it's equally important to make sure the insurance company is a good fit with the client. Your broker must be able to coordinate risk control services, claims management, and other financial issues. They need to leverage the internal offerings of those insurance companies to meet the needs. Each client has a different level of sophistication 
and needing these various areas of safety and risk management. And it's important that these are augmented as needed. As the market gets tougher, you need to make sure you don't have an agent that just understands insurance, but really understands your business. Do they know trucking business? Do they know trucking underwriter personally? How they do their job based on their knowledge is going to be so apparent to that underwriter when they explain your operation. I mean, the, the details of your operation and what makes you different. When they explain your accidents, when they explain what you're doing about it and how you're doing it, it's very obvious to those underwriters. Now let's talk about creating a strong safety program. As we said earlier, a strong and effective safety program begins with the hiring process. It is a gatekeeper function. You are hiring people into your family and trusting them to work relatively independently in an often dangerous environment, the roadway of the United States. To start the process, it is critical to have objective criteria in place that are clear to your managers, line employees, and outside vendors. The criteria must make sense to operations, for example, requiring drivers to have a perfect safety record in an environment where it is difficult to find employees will not work, because what will eventually happen is exceptions will become the rule. Most insurance carriers will want to see your minimum hiring standards and are usually looking for some key requirements in regards to MVRs, your motor vehicle, your moving violations of your drivers, DUIs in the last few years, minimum driving experience, and sometimes age of drivers. Another important part of the hiring process is the interview. Just because a recruit meets your minimum hiring requirements doesn't mean that they should be hired. As we stated earlier, they will be joining your family and working with little direct supervision. The interview process allows you to get the chance to know these people and decide if they are of the caliber you are looking for and will be a good fit with both the job and your organization. In some cases, this can mean an interviewee who comes in in a dirty T-shirt and shorts may not really fit what you're looking for in somebody who, need, who you want to have as part of your team. Remember one other thing. These are oftentimes, these drivers are the face of your organization. So not only is this important to the insurance industry, to the underwriter, but to your clients as well. You can also use testing programs to weed out candidates that are more likely to be unsafe, lack integrity, or not be able to complete the job. Integrity testing is becoming more accepted. Additionally, pre-employment physicals are required by the DOT in many cases, and you can ask a candidate to complete, a fun to complete functional capacity exams if the job requires a significant amount of physical exertion. The hiring process that you have in place shows the insurance carrier that great care is being taken when selecting drivers and that the process is defensible in the case of a critical crash. Training is another important area where you have to be able to demonstrate a commitment to safety. The level of knowledge your drivers have, and in many cases, your willingness to work with your insurance carrier. During the onboarding process, you want to create a baseline of knowledge for your drivers. Make sure that your drivers know what they need to know in terminology that you want to use. Make sure that your drivers if there are any breakdowns later in safety, such as a crash or a near-miss incident, no one should be able to say that they didn't know basic safety concepts. Insurance carriers also like when this training includes discussions about what to do with the scene of a crash, as we talked about earlier, what to do in inclement weather, and defensive driving techniques. To reinforce this education, regular safety meetings should be held. The frequency will vary depending on the size and type of of fleet, as well as the safety culture of the organization. We talk about um, remedial training. In many cases, there are different forms, but it's a critical part of the safety process. What are you going to do if, you're, if you have that failure? And putting together a strong program and having some good examples uh, when talking to your, your risk control person from the insurance company tells a lot about, as Jerry was saying, the commitment of your organization. I also want to touch on driver, driver and vehicle tracking. Telematics is a term that's bandied about all the time now. It's using technology to track vehicle safety performance or location. It's a valuable tool. Knowing how your drivers are operating in real, in real time is a huge differentiator, and insurance carriers are starting to view it as an important piece of the safety program instead of as just a, a best practice used by some of the big guys.
Additionally, we talk about organizational effectiveness. That includes supervisors using telematics or other data to know and understand your drivers and fleet. We should know where they are, what they're doing, and how they're doing it. When a vehicle, at the end of the week, if you were to walk the line and look at your vehicle, regardless of their cars, light trucks, or semis, it should not come as a surprise to see some new dents and fresh scratches. Those kind of things should be looked at on a regular basis and addressed. Another area uh, we talk about putting together a strong safety program is driver retention and turnover, oftentimes the other key to the castle. The critical metric that is looked at closely by insurance underwriters and safety professionals is directly related to the hiring process. If you hire people who had, had eight jobs in the last three years, there's no reason that they're going to stick to your organization if they're job jumpers. One time prior to 2008, I was working with a couple of large fleets that had turnover rates in excess of 150%. That means for every truck driving job, they were hiring one and a half drivers per year. Today, turnover is averaging less than 100% for truckload fleet, but it's creeping up all over as there are fewer drivers and more open driving positions. There are a number of ways to reduce turnover including make sure, making sure that vehicles are in good condition and set up nicely for the type of work being performed. A reasonable trade cycle is important no matter what type of vehicle, as drivers often take pride in their units and spend a lot of time in them. Proactive and responsive maintenance are also important, as your drivers want deficiencies repaired once reported. I'm presently working with a fleet that had a family member running the maintenance department on a shoestring budget to save money, and he ended up causing drivers to leave. His brother finally put him in a different position after realizing that he was really costing considerably more than he was saving the company. We talk about standard of living, which is another key area that drivers think about. It includes time at work, home time, and work schedules. For me personally, while I like working at Hub, I do it to support and enjoy my family. If it would become too disruptive to my family life or not support us, I would probably start to look to do something else. Drivers are no different. When reviewing pay, it's often a good idea to do a local survey of what drivers are making in the area for your specific type of operation. It tells a lot about where you're going to be. Obviously, you don't want to be necessarily, it's hard to be at the top of the pay scale, but you don't want to be at the bottom of the pay scale, or you're just hiring your training employees to go somewhere else. Another area that's of critical importance is culture. Safety culture is huge. You want to create something that shows, as Jerry said earlier, the value of safety to the entire organization. Everybody needs to understand and promote this critical cause. One of the key things I often talk about in safety meetings, we want our employees to go home in the same or con better condition at the end of the day than they started. And they need to understand that and what it is that their part in this deal is. If I were to walk into any company, I should be able to say, who's responsible for safety, and every member of that organization should say, I am. Jerry, what are you seeing in the marketplace? Well, I'm, I'm surprised sometimes now that drivers are listening. We've been talking about CSA and MBR and insurance and rates. With the, I don't get much reaction from them, but now I am. I am seeing it. And what I see is they understand now that they're MBR and now they're PSP, which is, it stands for Pre-Employment Screening Program, most Motor carriers are starting to look at this because it will show you all of his scores that he's bringing onto your company. Um, as part of the federal motor carrier suggestion that you use it is the way to tell what you're about to hire and what you're about to add onto your list of uh, points. So they know if they're bad, their career may be in jeopardy. I've actually heard some of them who've lost their job and said, I can't get another job. And i got to tell you, that's what I've been waiting on because until it really happens, it's all what if. But I also see on the other side, the good driver, he's got a good MBR, he sees his PSP scores compared to others, and he knows he can ask you for more money, which means eventually you're going to have to ask for a rate increase yourself. And I think the most, better motor carriers will come out of this whole thing being able to ask for a rate increase and get them. Um, the other interesting thing, Steve, we've talked about is that now I think drivers are we're going to go to the ABC trucking company. Before they walk in interviews, they will pull up the Eurosaker scores. They will see if they want to be part of you. 
Because if you go to a place that's got tough scores or, or several alert statuses, it's more likely you'll get inspected more just because you're, you're, their name's on the side of your truck. And once you get inspected more, you probably get more violations. You get put in a group of subpar drivers, and it's just not where you want to be. So the poor drivers, the poor companies, are going to keep getting more poor drivers. The better guys are going to move on. Now, let me add on to that. You know, I used to do uh, risk control or law services for a large insurance company. And you can walk into an organization and look at the vehicle, look at the type of drivers, look at some driver files, and get a pretty good idea about what's going on pretty quickly. I would say that with probably 50% of it, 50 to 60% accuracy, I can predict which of my fleets, which of the fleets I've looked at is going to have a poor, a poor loss history in the next year. And, you know, it comes sometimes as a shock to some people outside of the industry, but those who are in the know look and say, and it doesn't matter if it's, we're talking about a, a heavy truck fleet, a school bus fleet, or even a construction fleet. When you look at who's there, how the driver, the driver's previous history, the condition of the vehicles, how they're treated, how they're par- even how they're parked on the lot says an awful lot. These are all part of putting together a strong safety program. It's that attention to detail that makes so much difference and is really very critical. So we're going to uh, kind of end this. We're talking a little more about improving the safety-related data that everyone has seen, and, you know, there's a lot of it out there, and believe me, these underwriters are looking at it. Um, I want to start this by saying we're not making suggestions, we're not suggesting that you make quick fixes to make things look better. We're talking about preparing early so you can begin working on problem areas of your company, not only make them look better for your next renewal, but to make the, the improvements to your company overall and make you a better, a better motor carrier. Um, I think when I think about, about preparing your company, as I just said, I think about when we sold our last house a couple of years ago. You know, two years ago was not a good time to be selling a house. Uh, it's a tough market. No one was really buying out there. We did our research. We picked an agent that specialized in our area and had a reputation for preparing your house to sell. I wasn't real sure what that meant, but I did a lot of research, and it sounded good. Uh, she did an analysis and began making suggestions to help us sell our house for more money. Since there are so many buyers out there, I mean, there's so few buyers and so so many houses for sale. She came in and moved furniture, moved her pictures, added some things, added lamps and some lighting. She recommended trimming some trees, moving up a bush here and there. And then the the cool, all coos, she puts a fresh cookie smell in the house on Saturday and Sundays. Um, you know what? We sold our house quickly. We got what we wanted to get for it. And I think preparing my house, which is already a nice house, Preparing it made it easier for someone to say, I want that one. And, you know, that's a little bit what we're talking about here. Uh, we've got to find ways to make your company better, make it look better than the competition. And if there's errors or problems going on, we need to fix it. And you can't do it in 30 days. So if you are planning for your renewal next month, you might as well plan for next year. Um, one of the things to look at is lost runs, lost history. What we like to do is go out on a periodic basis quarterly or biannually and, and do a claims review. So we can talk about the reserves. We can talk about trends that we're seeing. We can talk about odd claims. Maybe one that we see a reserve and say, wait a minute, do they know that our driver had a picture of it? So that's the time to make sure you're doing that. If you do it once a year, or I have to say, most motor carriers I go see get their loss runs at renewal time, the last second at renewal time, because the agent won't present them before that. And they're seeing these claims for the first time and saying, what is that claim? Why is that reserved there? And it's it's a little too late. It, it actually, Steve brought up a good point the other day. So often, these are claims that are our fault. Well, they still go on the loss run. And it still says uh, $15,000 reserve just until we find out what's going on. And we've got to put a reserve for your physical damage because even though someone else is at fault, no one else is claiming to offer to pay for it. So it's a physical damage claim until it's subrogated. Subrogation is the act of going out there and uh, recouping the money that's caused by another party. And some insurance companies do it. Some of them don't. But you can do it. I mean, there's third-party vendors out there that will go and subrogate these claims for you, that, you know, to do it for part of that fee of what you get back. But they will do it for you. And if you wait for the insurance company, sometimes you won't get this done. At the very least, the agent has to be able to explain that. That's not our claim. Here's what we're doing about it. On 
the same line, I like to see the big losses, the, the, the ones that are surprising, the ones that better be talked about and not let other drivers just see it and go, what is this? I like to know all the facts, bad or good, so we can explain it to the guy. If it was something horrible, let's say why it'll never happen again. You know, we went into a, a port where we've never been, and we don't go there anymore. Uh, we were driving at 4 a.m., and now we told our driver not to do that. But, you know, there's reasons for it. And when it's not our fault, obviously, we want to get police reports. We want to have industrial notes. We want to have pictures. And you present that to that underwriter when he's looking at those loss runs. It keeps him from saying automatically, ah, this, this doesn't look good, to, to maybe thinking maybe this is not a bad carrier at all. Um, another thing I think is important is uh, checking the, the, the uh, safer information is online. And as I promised, I wasn't going into a lot of detail and we'll keep this short. I really do think I need to spend a few minutes telling you about the CSA because some of you out there know some, some of you know more than me, but the education is, curve is all over the place. So let me take a second, and we'll always come back to this if you need us to later. Steve, make sure I don't go over two minutes talking about it. If I do, take the phone away. CSA is Compliance, Safety, and Accountability. It's a new tool that the FMCSA is looking at they created and they're looking at, and your insurance companies and potential insurance companies are looking at. Your shippers are looking at, and you're finding out right now. Uh, heck, your competition is looking at it, too, to see how they compare to you. When I talk to insurance companies since October, November, and certainly in December and January, they say it's the very first thing they look at. But there's also something called a CAB report, C-A-B, where it summarizes Everything on that do on that document for safer, as well as talking about your financials. It talks about who your customers are. It talks about where you've had violations. So they say, well, it looks like 50% of the business is in California, whereas the agent may say it's only 10% of the business. So I think that's it's important to know that people are looking at that. And we have that document, so we show our clients so they know what people are seeing. We can address anything that doesn't look right. Uh, what is it? The federal government uh, created a CSA to help monitor motor carriers or more motor carriers, uh, and to watch them closer in order to reduce accidents and fatalities. That's all it is. There's no big secret. It was just a better way to see more people and watch them closer. There's a lot of debate, and there's even a few lawsuits as to whether some parts of this are fair. But here's what I would tell everybody I talk to. All motor carriers are going by the same rules, and their percentage are simply a rank as they compare you to other motor carriers your size. So what is not fair for them is not fair for you and vice versa. Without going into a lot of detail today, let us say that these are rules and expectations, that, and they're clearly defined on the FMCSA website. And until something changes, this is one of the things that's further defined in motor carriers. We can put our head in the sand, or we can understand it, learn it, and try to make it the best of it. I think that some will embrace this, and they'll grow their fleets, they'll increase their rates, and they'll get the better drivers. And the others will simply go out of business because it's creating too much pressure. you got to be with it or against it. Lastly, the insurance companies are making decisions about whether to insure you and for how much, and depends partly on these scores. And more of your clients and these brokers out there are making decisions about whether to ship with you based on safer scores. And I'll throw in a couple two cents on this. You know, it, it, these are great tools. Looking at your online data is huge. When we talk about CSA, you know, some of the things to look at that I look at and I still look at, where are your violations? If there's seatbelts, that should be easy to fix. If you're not fixing seatbelt violations, which are very common, that means that your drivers aren't operating in a safe fashion. Again, going back to the start of our conversation almost 40 minutes ago, look at the maintenance, brake violations. Bam, these are things that are often correctable. Um, another important thing on here is if you are a commercial carrier, and I know not everyone on the call is, look to make sure that the violations are from your company. Uh, I was working with one company last week, a carrier, motor carrier down here in Texas. They had two DOT reportable crashes, one of which they were, they were replications of the other. There's something called data queue where you can go on and, and remove incorrect data. The same goes to your losses on your loss run. If something isn't yours, correct it. Frequency is, in my mind, reads severity. If you're a 10 truck fleet, and you're showing three losses, I'm going to say, oh, my gosh. Well, if one of those losses never occurred or is the same because it was self-reported, we need to have that pulled off. Again, as Jerry talked about subrogation, key part of that is if you collect $10,000 to fix your vehicle, and that goes back to the insurance company, 
make sure they pull in $10,000 out of the value of the claim. An an anomaly we have written here, if you have large losses, explain it. One of the things that used to really make me nervous and still does at times, you walk into a meeting with a a fleet operator, and it could be, in in, in one case, I was working with a company that delivered countertops, and they had 100, 100 trucks. They didn't understand their losses. And I'm sitting there, how can you not understand, if you have a $400,000 loss, how can you not tell me about the driver and what occurred? I say, well, it happened, you know, eight states away because we're in multiple states. That's not an excuse. It really, for most companies, one of the biggest exposures you have is sleep. Um, you know, for some folks, it, it, it's a hard thing to get your, your head around, especially um, if you have a private fleet and your core business isn't moving freight around. But, you know, when you think about that, that the company that makes countertops, their biggest claim is it's all likely that not somebody who got hurt because a piece of uh, granite fell off the counter at home or broke in half. It's because their, one of their vehicles crashes into a school bus. So it really is important to control this, to pay attention, to be able to explain your, your situation. And lastly, but not leastly, as it says here at the bottom, and really I think the key thing, is reducing your losses. Reduce that frequency, reduce that severity, pay attention to this really critical part of your business. They like said there's really very little area that provides a bigger exposure and more room for improvement. Uh, we want to, Jerry and I both want to thank you for taking the time to listen to us today, to be part of this. We're here, both of us and other members of Hub International, to assist with your fleet safety issues. We're a regular you know, resource for around the country, and we'd like to open it up for the questions at this time. At this time, if you wish to ask a question, please press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. You will hear a tone acknowledging your request and a prompt to record your name. If you would like to draw your question, press star, then the number two. Again, that is star one if you wish to ask a question. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. And I am showing no audio questions at this time. Does that mean that we answer every question? We want to thank everyone for attending. This concludes our webinar. Thank you, and have a safe day. Hey, guys, there's one web question. Oh. The, the web question is, is uh, do you think a person's appearance reflects their safety potential, i.e., a sloppy person will have more safety problems because they don't pay attention to details? I think what I really mean by that is I I was working with a refuse company a number of years ago, and if somebody walks in to an interview in a a tank top and a pair of shorts, that really doesn't show that they have a lot of value for the job that they're applying for. Um, By the same token, if somebody – we want to take pride in our work. If somebody's dressed in dirty clothes and showing up, there is a lack of pride, and to some degree – um, lack of concern for themselves and the organization. When I talk about safety, at first we hope people are safe because of the general public and, and think about everyone. Then if not that, I hope that they think about they value their job, they value the company they're working for in that relationship, providing for their family. And if they don't think about that, hopefully they take pride and concern in themselves um, so that they're safe. And if they can't do that, then you got to wonder about them as an employee. I guess really, when you're at work, we expect you, hopefully, to, to dress accordingly for the job. That doesn't mean everyone's got to be in a suit and tie every day, but it does mean that, yes, you get some level of, of neatness. Jerry? I was, I was going to add, you heard the old analogy, but you can't judge a book by its cover. Well, when you go to a courtroom and you sit in front of a jury and you're a trucking company that has hurt someone, if your driver comes in with a tank top and unshaven, they're judging a book by its cover. So, yes, you do need to be professional looking, you know, you're representing the trucking company. That's it for the web questions. And there are no audio questions at this time. Well, again, thank you very much. Uh, we have our contact information up on the screen. Please feel free to contact Jerry or I at any time. And a reminder, the recording and the slides will be available on our website 
at www.hubinternational.com slash business-insurance slash risk-services webinars, uh, as you can see on there, within 48 hours, both the slides and the recording, and you'll receive a confirmation of that if you re register for the webinar. Thank you.